Hi, I'm Mark Cleborn here for the Photographer Academy. Welcome to the live. The bad news is our little doggy friend has had to call off today, so we're not shoot, shooting live. I'm sorry, it's not my fault, okay? Happens. Uh, look, I still want to talk, talk you through um, how to shoot it and what the setups are and everything else. If you're looking to set a small studio up, uh, we're in changing rooms. So if you've been watching our series over the past few weeks, month, uh, you'll know that we've turned this from a boudoir to kind of headshot studio and now into a dog studio. So uh, we're going to be looking at setting up and what I'd recommend that you're kind of doing for yourself to maximize the variety and the minimal amount of time. Uh, the first thing I should say is that really I am not a dog photographer in any means and I don't want you to think I am. Uh, I can photograph dogs, yes. Why? Because technically I'm a commercial photographer, means I should be able to photograph anything. But truly, uh, you know, when you start to talk about pets and dogs and animals, ho horses and so on, uh, you know, when you're a specialist in that field, you will usually produce a much, much better image than a jack of all trades as such. So if I was having to photograph commercially for a dog shoot or whatever it would be, then I would usually have the owner, the trainer, basically actually on hand to help command. Whereas a dog photographer, portrait photographer, pretty much is using all their skills to actually create the amazing as it were. Okay, uh, let's talk about the setup first uh, and kind of how I've changed the studio once more to give you that little bit of maximization to a, a small space. The first thing today, obviously we're set up for shoot, shooting wise, uh, even though we're not gonna be. And you're used to by now, um, just the orange cable is by Tether Tools. Uh, and this basically links into the camera, uh, the camera port. It's uh, a pro K, a K, K cable, which means it's more or less light, likely to take damage, all right? So in other words, it's stronger than the normal one off the shelf, as it were. Um, I tend to actually work, I'm not sure if you've seen it, but during the shoots, um, I would tend to actually work with an extended uh, cable. Uh, so I've got two cables together, so around about 30 feet in all. Uh, and this is basically with a shuttle that kind of combines the two together, if you've ever wondered what that was. Right, uh, let's talk about setup one. Setup one is whatever your classic kind of shoot is going to be. Some of you will go for an old master brown. Some of you will go for an old master black. Uh, I would suggest to you though, uh, where possible, is that when you have a dog which is dominantly black, you should have an old master black, as it were. So in other words, something with a, a black overall and then obviously kind of a, a, a lighter area in the middle or even actually having some third par party light put in there, whatever it be. In this case, we're using one of my favorite backgrounds of all time. Uh, it's basically kicked around, ripped, everything, you name it. But this is my kind of go-to. Uh, go it, it stuffs in the bag. If I'm jumping on a plane, that is guaranteed to go with me no matter what and things really. What I've done is I've put it on one of the uh, fully extendable heavy du uh, duty background supports. Um, but because we're only kind of putting a lightweight like cloth on, um, what I've done is in fact, instead of attaching the background support, which I'll show you now in a minute, it's a quick release and you can put it up and down by yourself. But instead of attaching it to a, a light stand by itself, yeah, uh, what I've done is I've put it onto a tether tools mount here, which is connected to the act, actual light stand itself, all right? Um, the reason being on this, I'm trying to minimize uh, things in small spaces. You know, remember changing rooms, this series that we're doing is all about minimizing space so you can maximize variety in the minimal amount of time. So we're going to be, look, uh, be looking at this. As it is, I've threaded the brown onto here to be given with, and that is pretty much where I would start the shoot, a continuous color tone throughout. I would try and get this um, background. I've just put a small one of our posing uh, elements under here for now. Um, but you might want to go for something a little bit more soft and padded, a, a stool or a padded whatever. Similar kind of color tones. Color palette is essential for me to actually make sure that everything harmonizes together. So in other words, if that was a black back, a background, it would be uh, a kind of a, a black kind of covering that we've got here and things as well. So as far as the covering's concerned, um, re I really want to want to do is have a depth of field, if possible, of around about three feet. 
One of the key things with specifically dog photography is because of the extended snout with a majority of dogs. You often heard me talk about F4 for kind of most of work that I do. Um, but however, when we need groups, we need to a kind of a, a deeper depth of field to accommodate one per, per person stood behind another perhaps, or even a couple where we want the classic, so the back shoulder is sharp, the front shoulder is sharp, and obviously all the face. So we usually work on F8, and I would suggest to you that you're working on between 8 to 16 for dog photography, especially when you're doing a close-up image of the head, unless it's for creative re reasons. The reason for doing that is to make sure the tip of the snout, okay, which is bigger than my nose, and my nose is big, all right, but it's much, much bigger, so you need to actually go from the fo uh, focus, tip of the spout, snout, to the eye, and a little bit of the ear as well. Whereas in headshot photography and portraiture and everything else, you know I talk about focusing on the eye, the F4 with uh, the likes of a 85mm lens, a 50mm lens, gives, gives me that true depth of field from here, from the beginning of the nose to actually the, the, the front of the ear. So that gives me that lovely kind of balance. So in this case, when I'm setting up, everything would be based around, let's say, F11 uh, as a rule of thumb. Uh, remember that if your lights can't get to that power, use your ISO game as long as there's no natural light in studio to affect the, ev uh, the everyday photograph from the beginning of the day to the end of the day, in other, in other words. So once I've kind of got the shot here, we need to talk about the lighting of how we light, light like this. And what I would do is use as big a softbox as you physically own and wash it across the subject. In a small space like we have now, pretty much... Um, you can get away with having uh, the likes of a small or big white reflector here, even the likes of one of my posing tubs, which we make ourselves, yeah? Or to be fair, Sean, our DIY man does. Um, but even one of these stood like this can actually act as a reflector to kind of help fill in just a little bit more. Obviously, the bigger the box, the bigger the reflector. And what I would suggest, uh, especially if you're going to be featuring multiple dogs, twos, threes, fours, and above, you really want to make sure that you've got plinths that are big enough to extend the shoot view in different heights, whether they're going to be on the floor, whatever it be, and things really. Okay, so this can also act like a reflector in its own right. Never forget that. So with the key light here, um, I basically would want separation from that side. So in this case, I would switch off this light. Um, we've got a Elencrom um, ELC Pro HD head here, which is a thousand head. And we've got around about a meter oct octa, uh, which is a Rotolux box to give you an idea on size. But if you've got one and a half, better again, okay? So just the bigger, the best, but wash the light across. If you think about the start of this light, it's, all, it's almost in line with the front of the box prop, yeah? Um, it could even come a little bit backwards towards here, but I want it slightly forward of the dog. So in fact, this side of the soft, the soft box illuminates the dark side of the dog. One of the most important things to do with anything to do with a texture like fur or hair is to actually add separation. That's what this baby's doing, okay? It's another ELC head. It's got a, a Fotix kind of Raj Roval on the front, but the key thing is it's got a honeycomb grid, an egg crate actually on the front. That's just gonna control the amount of spillage uh, around the whole thing. Now, between this light and this light, there's one stop in difference. It doesn't matter if it's a white dog or a black, a black dog, I wanna keep it to one stop. If you find for any reason that you're overpowering the background, especially on lighter fur, then tone it back a little bit, even half to full stop again. But you'll soon come with practice. As a rule though, start with a one stop difference. Remember, the light, be the light from behind appears twice as bright as it comes off a reflective surf surface like skin or hair, whatever it be. So it increases its value, but we still want this kind of little bit of a glamour kind of separation for the likes of dog photography. So with that in mind, uh, basically dog posed on here to begin with, nice and low, nice and light to actually be able to actually get the animal to create. And uh, what we'll have a look in a minute is some shots that of uh, a dog we shot earlier this year. So from here, so that was set one, yeah? Set two, I wanna move straight through to perhaps 
high key. Um, so what I've done is I've kept the wall um, absolutely white and bright behind. And you're going to say, well, why have you kept the background so low? Because they're dogs and they're that big. <laughs> okay, so they're not very tall at all. So we've just got to make the most of it. What I would do, though, if you're setting your studio up in a permanent way, is don't have a kickboard or a skirting board, yeah? Barge board, whatever they're called. Um, if you do have to have one, paint it a colour, white or whatever it would be, but try and make it disappear. Where possible, though, don't have it on there at all, and get yourself some Velcro and just basically stick it along the wall itself, and basically stick some vinyl floor into it, some white vinyl floor into it. You get a natural cove then, no matter what, okay? It could, it could be um, something that you've got for a third part, a party background. Bra Brandon, if you stay on this camera, I promise not to do anything weird. Could you just go get me a last light train for a highlight? Yeah. Thanks, the biggest that you've got there, yeah? Um, I would make sure you don't stick a, <laughs> a plug point in the back of the background. I've mentioned it before, some electrician in their own field of daylight thought that was the correct place on the plan. He wasn't, it should have been over in that corner, uh, but they've put it there in their wis wisdom. If you found that this was a permanent space, spend the money, get it moved, yeah? And get it fixed so you don't have to do the work. I kind of believe that if you're working too hard with images, in other words, if you're retouching things too many times, you basically need to fix it at the core. So in other words, just don't do all the work in the post as it were. Yeah, you've got to fix the core to save you time later. So a few hours and a couple of, a couple of hundred quid to actually get that fixed is going to save you hours and hours of time during the course of the year and things. So with this background, what I would then do is actually light the actual background itself. Um, this is where I would want the, the kind of the secondary light that we've got up on here to move to a kind of a, a stand position. Should I steal that a minute? Yeah, it's, tied. it's tied. That's okay, thanks mate. So this is a roll away vinyl. This is for one of the, um, high, uh, the highlights. Let me just take off the... He should be able to pull it and he'll come off. He said, there we go, okay. He didn't do it for me though, do you know who does that? Likes me to work for my living. Uh, okay, so this has some Vel Velcro on here that basically is on all the highlights anyway. There's no need for a close-up. It's Velcro, all right? And then what I meant was if we were to kind of just have, have this across the wall, around about this height, pretty much it's going to be, a, be able to give, uh, give you a white background straight, uh, straight away. If we just kick that away for a minute, you'll, you'll know what I mean just by getting that up the wall and allow it to actually lap down and things. What we want to do, though, is be able to light this background more than it is. So this is where this little light here could come off this lighting stand, yes, and basically go onto a floor stand or even onto another clip that could go onto that light stand, put a barn door on the side and get, get that to light, light it from one direction. I would say that if high key uh, backgrounds were a part of your working set, setup, then I would make sure you light from both sides. I know it's a little bit more kit. I can't make apology on that, but if you can light from two directions to light the background, you get a much even spread of light and there'll be almost no post-production. So you could physically go straight from a studio shoot straight into a, a viewing if that's what you had to do anyway. Right, so uh, the kind of the high key is a quick setup. I think though, that is too much faff for a dog to begin with, all right? In other words, I don't want to frighten the animal. So in fact, this um, could be the, the kind of the third or the fourth element to the shoot. Let me move that out of the way for me. Okay, instead, uh, we can move the kind of the posing prop to light the, um, or to be used with the pink background, let's say. He says, waiting for this to power up. And at this point, all I've got to do is move my lighting stand once more. This might kind of knock you all out of shot. I do apologize. But just in front of the actual dog again. And this will act in exactly the same way. The benefit we have, I'll just move this so you can see it, all right? So the, 
the, the stand shot is here. The benefit now, if we kind of just move that to the side, do you know what? We haven't even gone live with Tether. Let's just see if um, we can show it for a minute. F8, D, 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 all lights. Fingers crossed it's going to tether in. It is. So straight away, we've got a quick kind of shot uh, to do with a pink background. If I want more of that light to hit the background, obviously all I need to do is remove the actual uh, honeycomb grid straight away, yeah? Do exactly the same shot. I would put a barn door so we make sure it doesn't spill onto the, the dog. And then straight away we've got a shot. One thing I'd encourage you to do though is to remember to switch this light off. Remember, it's a separation light when we were photographing from that position towards the background. But now when I'm photographing from here towards the pink background, there's a possibility it is going to actually do a part of the shot. So if I just switch to group three, which this one is, and I take the shot, you're going to see if that white is lit much, it's basically, is it there? There's a little bit of spill. As is, probably you could get away with it, kind of an accent or a, a separation light kind of thing, you know. Um, but again, where possible, if you can switch this light off because you usually just overcome or complicate the whole scene and things really. Right, what else we got? So there's my kind of number two set. My number three set would obviously be this direction, and it doesn't help at this stage, that I did move this up. And what I've done here is I've got a variety of pop-up backgrounds. Uh, to make it nice and easy for Brandon a minute, our video guy, I'm just going to move this light to this side. As is, though, there is no reason at all for the main light source to travel from one side of the studio to the other. It should have actually remained on this side without any trouble. What I've done here is I've just put a few backgrounds pop-ups up, yeah? So uh, if I just shoot towards here to begin with, yep, yeah, there's instantly our shot. Uh, this is with a kind of a metal backdrop though. I'll shoot that in the vertical for you so you can see what's going on. And that's the only negative when you're using some of the background pop-ups with patterns is that they can look weird when you put it to the side. As is, this one doesn't. All right, because of the metal um, styling that is on there. So if I shoot the same thing, and remember, as a rule, we're going to need around about a three-foot kind of shooting bench to allow a kind of a biggish dog to stand on there or put the paws on there and so on. But... From here, you can see the difference now. If I just zoom, zoom back a bit, uh, and I go to the D, 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 the other shot, we've got a good depth across the whole thing. What I would do, though, is try and have a similar color to what we shot with before. You'll see the difference now, yeah? How we can disguise the high uh, key white um, stool, step, whatever, and we can shoot the same thing. And this is what you'll see about the color palette. D, 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 let me just do the shot. Switch off again. Mark okay, leg on. D, D, D. I think it's new camera style time. One second. It has worked very hard over the years. <laughs> Let's do it. No, that's something on the zoom, that is. Okay, so we can't do that. What a shame. All right, it's a good job the, dog, uh, the dog's not here. Um, so we would have actively had that kind of uh, image and the tone. I wonder... Can you just get me another lens, mate, Brandon? D, D, D. Thanks, mate.
There we go. It wasn't anything to do with the camera. It was to do because I opened the battery compartment with my nose. See, that's what happens when you get a big, a big nose. Right, let's do the same thing. So we've got the 50 mil lens on, so I need to get a little bit closer anyway. But we can see here now how the color palette is in the same tone. So whatever you're doing, try and make sure that you kind of put in all those elements together because that's going to make a big dif difference. The reason I had the 24 to 105 lens on, let's just check it works, um, is because I do like the ability with pet photography and with some kid photography that we've got that control, yeah? Uh, in other words, we've got the ability to uh, kind of zoom in and out quickly, whereas uh, with adults, there's no reason. So there's, there's the big difference how you can see straight away, but you want to make sure you're using that separation light. And if possible, move the separation light so it's on the opposite side. So we're using like a sandwich technique that really shows off the uh, fur line. Otherwise, we'd have to have the separation light coming from here. Of course, the other benefit of having pop-ups if you want to actually change a background straight away, you can. He says it's easier for a minute just to collapse it. Put that away. Let's put that against there. So we've got another background. I'll just do a quick shot. Similar tone, but this is in the kind of the, the brown old master effect again. So if you didn't have a big kind of curtain with it, then that's fine. Opposite side is like a green old master style as well. We'll get rid of that. But re really what we wanted to show was if you have that set as your brown set, and then we basically have another color, like up here we've got a blue. Let me just drop that down. Um, straight away, we can basically cover this with another color and we can start to actually work straight away. Okay, so think about what's on the opposite sides of studio with it. That's not the clever part in the setup, to be honest, I think. If we just move this back de -de -de -de, towards here. So remember, at this stage, we're technically shot towards the brown background one, the white background two, yes, the pop-up pink here three, or another color, or a textured wall, or whatever you want to do. Uh, so that's four. No, nope. one, two, three. Onto the pop-ups on this side for a possible kind of use of the drape. However, uh, what we're doing is using the blue cloth now for a much bigger group of dogs. So if we had multiple dogs in the scene, you definitely want to be able, able to have a background quite quick to be able, able to put across your studio floor, which if you're um, colored, stretchy, old canvas, master, whatever it would be, I'd definitely buy two of the backgrounds as soon as you know it's the right one, uh, but actually have that to go across the floor, to go across the props and everything else. And straight away, you've got another background, okay? So just have, having uh, a separate one off the, to the side will really allow you to kind of work a lot quicker as such. And then, of course, we've got the addition, if we want to, last but no means least, is our paper back, uh, backdrops. And this can obviously just come down then. Kind of there's our colour, whatever they are. We've got three up on the rack. And then if we kind of just slide this in, yep, and we slide another one in as well. D, D, D. I would try and make them the same height, unlike these two. One is slightly bigger than the other. And then either have a com complementary card or have a clashing card. So in other words, we're going to blue very, very similar, paste it towards the back so we know that this is the fall off point. The dog could come for uh, forward of this space without any trouble. Owners on the same side as the light or on the opposite side, depends on the control of the dog, but really I'm trying to call all the the kind of expression, look and gaze and so on, or get the owner, the owner's squeaky toy or whatever they do to actually get the gaze across. So I can either shoot like that, let's just do a quickie. So remember the same thing, 
turning the light across the side, we're not changing apertures or anything else. We go into a kneeling kind of pose. And the same thing would be a very, very similar color palette. If that comes up, yeah, you can see that. And that's without an, a lit background there at all. If I wanted to light this background, okay, from the likes of this, I couldn't just turn this around and light it from this direction. It needs to move out to about here, yeah? Or we need to have that other little background light support on the stand. These tether tool clamps are really good to what they kind of want to use. And if I didn't want the shadow from the likes of the pole, what I've done on the heavy duty support here, I've basically just got it in a movable, so otherwise, in other words, I can just move this out of shot, bring this stand in, take it up just a little bit higher. Dee, dee, dee. Oops. Put that on there. And that's basically out of my way. And so I can either light it from the likes of the floor. So let's just take this off. I wouldn't have, as a rule of thumb, a light on the floor behind a dog in case it wanted to lick it, pee on it, or whatever. I would always have it on a stand. Um, and if we just kind of work with that on the floor for a minute, you'll see the three dimension. I haven't meet, meet it a minute. This is probably going to be way too powerful. But if it is going to be bright, it has to be from the same side as the key, uh, the key light. Yeah, so you can see it's way, way too powerful, but will give good separation. In the same way, let's remove the complementary card in color and we'll go to the clashing color. It doesn't have to be card, it could be painted wood, yeah? Let's do the same thing before I reduce the power down. Now from group four, that is Group four, I'm gonna go down two stops. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Do the same shot. Go to all. There we go. So within here, you can see what we've done is gone from a kind of a burnout level to a little bit more controlled kind of three-dimensional lighting. What you want to avoid though, if possible, is pointing the key light down onto a card. So in other words, if I got this closer and higher and I tilted down, what would happen is the light is gonna bounce off the card and then bounce up onto the dog. So it means that all the underbelly of the dog and the legs are actually gonna look a little bit red or blue if it was the other card, compared to actually in the way that we had the light here, where it washes across the dog, and basically it's just going to allow us to have that beautiful kind of light from beginning to end. That's us done. So I'm sorry we didn't have a dog, <laughs> um, but you get a good idea of what we can do in such a small space and things. So we're live. Uh, I'm not sure if there's any questions coming through. Brandon, is, yeah. is that a day? Oh my God, okay, I am not a dog photographer. Let's not forget that I said that right at the beginning. Go on. Hello, dog photographers. Okay, so the first question coming through, besides for I'm a dog photographer, I'm a dog photographer, I'm a dog photographer, I'm not a dog photographer, I'm not a dog photographer, I'm not a dog photographer, okay? I'll just reiterate that. We're working in just short of five meters width by about five meters depth. We could pretty much get away with about four without any trouble. Just basically uh, lint or a good, a good cleaner between shoots. Uh, is there a way to do that in post-production? Yeah, just use these dust and scratches. It's a quick, a quick fix. Okay. That is about it. 
Should we jump to the uh, dog shoot on the laptop a minute? Uh, this is Zuko, in fact. Uh, he's our graphics girl's uh, dog, and he came in for a shoot. This is a kind of uh, a variety of images that I would expect to have to take. So I'm definitely going to be photographing as far as the full length is concerned. Uh, in this case, we're using one of our metal boxes, all right, instead of a, a wooden one. I thought this was a bit too slippy for the dog, and hence we haven't used it with any dog shoots since and things, really. Uh, we're looking at not only uh, him looking to the profile position, but we're getting him to look towards me. One of the benefits of, of this shot is that because the accent light, the separation light, is coming in from the left-hand side, we've got this lovely accent light running down the face as well with it and things really, which gives a great three dimension. This is what I was on about with a black old master. Um, if you've seen us before, this is one of our big event backgrounds. That is a, per a perfect setup. You've seen us use that, in fact, in the past few weeks in the likes of the headshot photography and so on, all right? So if you didn't see that, go back and watch that and you'll know exactly the one I'm on about. Um, so here we've got a nice kind of close-up uh, image as far as the full, full length. Then this is pure black, okay? So in the old master, if I didn't light, uh, allow light to spill, then basically I could shoot like this without any trouble. It's quicker to throw a black background behind them to completely absorb all the light. Then you, you can see we've actually got a double separation going on. That, that would equate to, yeah, this light coming through and this light uh, coming through as well, all right? So that would be either with a another soft a soft box or it'd be with a grid on yeah uh, so the honeycomb grid to to kind of control the spillage that's really what we're trying to achieve yeah remember honeycomb grid both the big egg egg crates on the soft boxes uh, and uh, that's where the Fotix boxes, in fact, are really great value because they come with them, whereas the light quality from a Elinchrom Rotolux is phenomenal. The uh, uh, cost of the actual grids to go on the front is phenomenal, uh, which is unfor unfortunate. So again, as far as grids are concerned, whether it's like a grid to go on the front of hard, hard light, uh, remember, as you slightly turn it, it kind of won't allow light to spill, okay? So that's why we use both this and an egg crate uh, to control the light. Uh, and that's what gives us this lovely snout kind of look. Even the gaze slightly towards camera is fine. Looking back to me, we've got good light, good lighting running through it. Just going through some of the shots with her. And then we're into that blue, oh, it's the same blue background. How lucky is that? And then we're using just a yellow card to actually get something similar. Is this film live on Academy yet? It's not. When's it going to be live? He's going to say next week, because we haven't been able to shoot live. So next week it's going to be live on the Academy to watch, all right? Uh, sorry about all you, you, you uh, YouTube viewers. Uh, I'm sure at some stage you'll be able to watch it on the Photographer Academy uh, channel here, but otherwise nip over to the Photographer Academy website and you'll be able to see it there. Um, so again, going through the images, and I do like variety. So you can see how the card is being changed from the kind of the blue to a pink to a red pink. So that's half and half, yeah? This is where we can reduce down to possibly the likes of F4, 5, 6 to drop that focus out of the background more. And then actually just running through it. I'm definitely looking at some close-up shots as well as the full length shots. Really want to actually uh, allow some space around the image to think about the fra uh, framing as well. This is uh, Zuko, in fact, from a few years ago uh, with his underdog images that we did for him. Uh, and uh, again, what, what we've got is that same pink background above him is uh, creating our colour. So uh, again, uh, different things for different dogs. They come in time and time again. Obviously, depends on the weight of the dog. You can see that white box is being used now as a part of the set. And he's just kind of walking back and forth. And you can see how we've illuminated the background pink as well and given it some three-dimensional halo going through it. So uh, again, obviously, it depends on the client, whether they've got some gimmicky clothes, whatever it would be, actually using. This is, it looks a bit strange now, but this is the white box that is catching light. And this is the pink background. So if I was doing that today, theoretically, I'll just move this out of shot for a minute, yeah? just so I don't get confused. <coughs> Let's put that across there. A 
okay, without these backgrounds there, of course. But realistically, we'd be photographing with Zuko just in the front of the box here. Yeah, he's in the front here. It would be catching the light from the key, uh, the key light itself. And then obviously the, the pink would be illum illuminated by the likes of the light here. And tighten it and just turn it around. So that, that would give us that kind of effect. So this real kind of double color as well. Good. Um, bit of fun. And then we finished off with the, again, that paper. Uh, we've added a bit of texture into here though now, and we've added a balloon to him. <laughs> He's not wearing a balloon, I promise you, okay? It is just done in the post, okay? That's the key thing. But if you've got a jumping dog, what are they jumping for? It's either going to be a treat to pop something or whatever it is. If you can do it in the post-production without a huge amount of work, then do it, of course. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, okay, more questions, go. The cloth background. Uh, yeah, you know what? I think this, this is where it comes down to what your preference is. Do we want the cloth background to be wrinkle-free? It is a personal thing. Um, really, with the depth of field that we're going, it's a, a background with a wrinkle in is going to be a background with a wrinkle in, and you're going to smooth that out probably because it's going to get on your nerves. If you can stretch it, it's better off. Some of the other cur uh, the curtain backcloths, like this one, Oh, there we go. This is a stretchy fabric, in fact, compared to the brown one, which is kind of really old. But this is a stretch one, and this will basically pull all the actual wrinkles out. That's why I was suggesting to you to use two backgrounds. One, one for the background, and one for the um, floor and, and the prop. And the reason to do that was to ensure that we could stretch the background for big groups of dogs, and then the other one, which we can use as a, a kind of a wrinkly, patterned, uh, what's the word, um, textured, I suppose, kind of actually as far as the covering of the props is concerned. Once again, is there a post-production fix for that? Post-production fix, yeah, just Gaussian blur really is the quickest one. Uh, it depends on how, how much work and how often you're doing it. But a, Ga a Gaussian blur fix. Do you know what? Let's uh, do it in uh, Academy Live on Monday, shall we? Uh, we've got the Photoshop school running, so let's, uh, let's do that live on Monday. May, uh, make a note, whatever we're going to do, we'll change it. Oh, I got a tip of the day. Do not photograph dogs with bare feet. <laughs> All right? I speak from experience. You know, most of the time, I'm shooting bare, bare feet and shorts, yeah? Do not photograph with some, some dogs with bare, with bare feet. They do bite, and I'll leave it there. Go, Brandon. Um, could you use a grid on the light behind a light box instead of an egg grid? Uh, you need to speak up a little bit. I can't hear you, sorry. Could you use the lights from behind? Could, could you use a grid from the lights behind rather than an egg grid? Uh, you could. But obviously, with multiple dogs or a big dog, you're going to need the spread of the light more. Um, so I definitely, I mean, the uh, Photix ones, you're looking about 100, 120 quid with a grid. Invest once, it'll save you hours and hours of headaches of not se uh, separating enough. So I, I, would spend, I would spend the money. Yeah, sure. If I've got any images at all with shedded hair, I'll do that with no, with no problem at all with it and things, really. But again, your worst com comes the worst. Is the dog going to be groomed before, forehand? Uh, it's, it's really down to whether it's a long-haired dog. Remember, I am not a dog photographer, so you guys are going to be seeing hundreds of breeds going through yours. Uh, I've got a black lab, and if there's anything to drop hair, it's it. Uh, but at certain times of year, and in heat, and one of the reasons that you wouldn't want it hot in a studio like we are today, that they'll start to actually drop hair straight away, of course, I would think. That's it, though, yeah? Yeah, that's it. Thanks for joining me live, guys. Remember to head over to the Photographer Academy uh, for any of the, uh, the information. Um, before I go, let me just show you that Tether Tools clamp. So, um, Tether Tools, if you're unaware, they just don't do the orange cables. 
but they do lots of different clamps and battery kind of aids and power aids and things with it. Okay, so this is one of their clamps that we've got here. This is going on to the lighting pole, and then we've adapted it with another accessory to allow a, a background to actually be support, uh, supported on it. So uh, again, you can get different things to do different things, uh, 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 kind of tasks, but make sure you basically have a little look at the likes of the Tether Tools uh, variety of products. I talk so much about their uh, orange cables, of course, uh, and there's so much more to Tether Tools than just that. That's us out. See you soon, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.